It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest lecturer this evening, actress and wildlife advocate Jane Alexander. She is best known for her screen and stage careers, holding a place in the Theater Hall of Fame and garnering a Tony, two Emmys, an Obie, a Drama Desk Award, and a Theater World Award. She, ser <clears throat> excuse me, she served as the chairwoman for the National Endowment for the Arts and is dedicated to the causes of world peace, wellness, and wildlife conservation, serving as a board member of the Wildlife Conservation Society and the National Audubon Society, among other organizations. In her new book, Wild Things, Wild Places, Adventurous Tales of Wildlife and Conservation on Planet Earth, she presents a moving and inspiring look at the crucial work of wildlife preservationists across the globe. Publishers Weekly hails Ms. Alexander's articulation of her exhilaration of the wonders of nature and her willingness to ford streams, slash through jungles, and scale mountains to defend it. Her talk tonight will be in conversation with Associate Director of the Library's Author Events Program, Laura Kovacs. We are so pleased to have her here with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jane Alexander to the Free Library. Know you as an actress, and you're famous for being an actress, but you've had a parallel life as a conservationist and as a nature lover. Can you talk about the relationship between the two? Well, I I like to think that there's the imagination of the creator, which cr created the universe and the world, and then there's the imagination of the uh, highest order of mammals. Uh, human beings uh, who create uh, the art. And um, that's what we use our imaginations for and try to figure out how the universe works. You write, of all the places I've been, my own backyard, my patch, is the place I know and love the best. Would you share the story from the book about your work as a pi piping plover guardian? Oh, thank you. Uh, the piping plover, many of you probably know this, but it's a, it is an endangered species. There's about 8,000 of them left, and there's about 5,000 in the Great Lakes area, and there's about 3,000 uh, in the Atlantic coast, coastal area, all the way from the Bahamas right up to uh, Newfoundland. And I live in Nova Scotia. Uh, my family's been there for hundreds of years. And I am a piping plover guardian the past 20 years in Nova Scotia. Uh, this means that I go out and I monitor how their nests are doing, how many eggs they've laid, um, how many fledge. And this happens over a period of about six weeks in uh, mid-June through late July, sometimes into August. And then when they take off, um, you may be interested to know that the female leaves after, <laughs> after the chicks are about a week old or 10 days old and leaves father to bring them up for fledging. <laughs> but I figure that, uh, and I think science backs me up on this, that um, you know, when there's only 8,000 of you left, you, you maximize your chances <laughs> as a female to produce more. There's so we protect them and then, excuse me, we also uh, we only have them in, in the north, in the breeding areas, for you know a couple of months, and then they go down. It was recently discovered that now they think fully 15 to 20 percent of the piping plovers in the United States go to the Bahamas. They're no fools. Nice place in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we did go to the. I'm on the national board of the Audubon Society, and I went to um, the Bahamas to see where the piping plovers were there. They're on two keys primarily, and we, uh, we begged the Bahamian government to make them protected areas, and within a year and a half, the Bahamian government did just that. You define conservation as an attitude, a spiritual belief, and a regulation. Can you unpack that idea for us? Yes. Um, conservation as an attitude. I believe that many of us have a hostile attitude towards nature. Rather than opening up 
our hearts and greeting uh, any living creature, we will often try to get rid of it, get it off our lawns, get it out of our lives, get it out of our homes. Um, I theorize myself that if they bite me, then I can bite them back. But if they don't bite me, I'm going to give them half a chance to live. And I'm one of those rather uh, boring people that picks up moths or whatever little creature I find that takes them outside <laughs> if they're in my home. But this is a change in attitude for me because I used to be extremely scared of spiders. And uh, when I was very young, it was a, truly a phobia. I would scream very loudly. I had a mother, Nova Scotian mother, who in our backyard in Boston where I grew up, uh, Brookline, Massachusetts actually, one day I'm screaming on the back porch. I'm about eight or nine years old. She comes out. It's a summer day, and I still remember her sleeveless dress. And she reached up into the eaves under the back porch and pulled down a big house spider and let it crawl all up her arm, over her head, and down her back. And that was the beginning of the end of my fear of spiders. <laughs> so thanks to my mother. <laughs> It's unexpected to hear of spirituality in a discussion of science, but you and a lot of the scientists you travel with describe a very spiritual connection. Uh, Carl Safina, one of the scientists you mention in the book, just recently published a book about animals using words like empathy, personality, emotional life. Can you talk about this leap in science? Yes, it's, it's pretty extraordinary what's happened in my lifetime, certainly, to see uh, pure science go from research to protection of the species. These are for the field biologists, and I'm going to limit my conversation to field biologists primarily because those are the ones I've traveled with. The whole first part of my book is called Tiger Man, and it's about um, a field biologist named Alan Rabinowitz. And Alan went from, being, from studying jaguars in Belize at the age of 30 in a pure scientific way through that period of two years to understanding he needed to protect the jaguars in Belize that he was studying, or they would soon be gone. And so he founded the first jaguar preserve in the world in Belize in Coxcomb Basin. And um, so this is what's happened with science. And there is also, as you, you, you cite uh, Carl Safina, who's one of our greatest uh, nature writers, and a marine scientist, actually. His book, Beyond Words, is, has taken a huge leap for science because he is talking about the emotional behavior and the personalities of wild dolphins, whales, and wolves. And I urge you to read it because it's, it's certainly a huge leap. Some of you may remember when Jane Goodall, back in the 70s, began to name the gorillas how she was repudiated by fellow scientists for doing so, said you cannot um, do pure science if you can't objectify your animals. Well, it turns out in the long run that Jane could do excellent science and also name the animals and become close to them. And this is where science for a lot of field biologists is heading today. They name the animals. They don't just give them numbers. I'm not talking about the legions of insects, of course. And I still have a hard time identifying individual chickadees when they come to my feeder. <laughs> but I'm working on it. <laughs> In a recent interview, you said, once I had a strong attachment to all living creatures, they literally started coming to me. I'm thinking about the story in the book with the Manal pheasant in Bhutan. I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about this. Um, on a visit to Bhutan, uh, Bhutan uh, a few years ago with the great ornithologist George Archibald, George brought the whooping crane, one of the people who brought the whooping crane back from almost near extinction. There were 44 birds left, and um, the whooping crane is still the most endangered of the 15 crane species in the world. And George was making an annual trek to Bhutan to check out the black-necked crane, which is a highly threatened species that lives in Tibet for most of the year and winters in um, parts of China and Bhutan. And it, so my husband and I went with a few others on this trip to Bhutan. 
and witnessed uh, the cranes flying by the hundreds over the Himalayas and down into Pobjika Valley in Bhutan and settle in for the night. It was an extraordinary sight. And they come in at the night and then they take off at, at dawn with their, with their young to go feed in the agricultural fields uh, left over seed. Well, I'm enamored of cranes, uh, but the one animal bird that I wanted most to see was a monal pheasant. The Himalayas have extraordinary pheasants, very exotic looking, and they do live at these high altitudes. And the manal pheasant I had seen in the Bronx Zoo, and it's a, a pheasant that has 13 different colors, but this doesn't begin to describe the gradations of the feathering and the, the colors as they go down uh, the back of the pheasant. So one day we were told by our guide, he, she, he said, well, whoever wants to get up at dawn and go up to a little monastery, we may have a chance to see the manal pheasant because I know an old monk who likes to feed the birds early in the morning. So we arrived just as the sun was hitting the beautiful red roofs of the little monastery, and there in the courtyard was this very old, old man feeding nine manal pheasants. And several of the males and the rest hens. So my heart stopped. A few people went to the balcony of the little monastery, and a couple of friends and myself went up a little path into a little field that looked down on the courtyard so that we could take pictures. And I had my Nikon at the ready, and then suddenly one of the male pheasants with about three hens leapt up and came over the field and then came right into the sunlight and was trembling in its iridescence. It was the most beautiful bird I had ever seen in the sunlight. And then I put down my camera and it kept walking closer and closer right into my shadow. And there he was right at my feet. I didn't move. He just kind of looked and pecked around and then walked away with his hands up the hill. <laughs> and I thought, wow, what a visitation. Well, I had kind of called him in, hadn't I? He was the one I most wanted to see. A lot about the conservation movement can be depressing, even despairing, but I would say your book is full of hope and excitement. Can you talk a little bit about the possibilities for success? Yes, well, one thing I wanted to write about was in my travels with field biologists around the different places, and I think there's about 20 places that I write about in the book. Not all of them. I do go to places on my own as well, mainly for birding. but. When I'm out with field biologists, what I learned was that they all have hope. First of all, conservation means hope. It, 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 you, you, can't, you can't even say that you're a conservationist and not be hopeful because that's what the word is about, conserving things. So we all, we all go on, on hope that things will get better, and indeed they are. And these field biologists now say there is no conservation without community. And what they mean by that is every community that they find themselves in where there's an animal or a habitat or many animals they're trying to preserve in a particular place, they have to involve the people in the community with pride in that creature, education about that creature, and an understanding of the uh, value of biodiversity and the sustainability of their own lives if they allow the animal to thrive as well. Now that doesn't mean that they can't take the animals or they can't plant certain things in certain areas, but they have to understand the balance of it all better than many places are today. So I'll give you an example. Um, I was in Papua New Guinea with the, the great ornithologist Bruce Beeler, who is the bower bird and bird of paradise expert. And mainly we were there to see the birds of paradise and the bower birds, but we, I did see lots of birds of paradise and they were simply glorious. But the woman who was with us, who is working in the same area, is a woman from Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle named Lisa Dabek. And her signature species that she studies is called the Machis tree kangaroo. Now there is 
a number of tree kangaroo species. And this Machis tree kangaroo is absolutely adorable. It's about this big. It looks like a Paddington teddy bear. It's as gentle as can be with big, long claws for climbing trees. It lives up in the canopy of the cloud forest in Papua New Guinea at about 8,000 feet. And it only lives in that part of the world, in the, the Juan Peninsula. And it loves to eat orchids. <laughs> so to see one of these gorgeous little creatures up there munching on a little pink orchid is just to die for. So now, um, what Lisa had to do, because the Machis tree kangaroo is also delicious, I didn't eat them, but the villagers there, the clans people eat them. Lisa had to go to the 40 villages that are, live around the habitat of the tree kangaroos. And she had to talk to each one about the value of the animal. And did you know, did you know that this animal only lives here in this part of the world and how rare it is? And in exchange for the protection of the tree kangaroo, and they did begin to f experience some pride about that animal in their midst, they, they allowed her to make a sanctuary that is just for the tree kangaroo, and of course by default, because it's one of the largest uh, animals in the area, everything else is protected as well. In exchange for that, they were allowed to hunt seasonally in the land outside the sanctuary um, for the nutrition that they need, the protein from the animal. And Lisa also helped them with education, with health care, and um, with some economic benefits through tourism. So this is a win-win situation for everybody. And this kind of hopeful situation is happening, certainly in many of the places that I have traveled with biologists, a similar scenario. So this is where we can have hope. Um, it becomes a sustainable animal for them to hunt in season and we still have plenty of tree kangaroos in that area. Is this connection to animals and the ability to study field marks and behavior in any way similar to the way that you inhabit a character you're playing? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Thanks. I haven't been told that. So. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm not a scientist, so I have my powers of observa observation, I think I'll limit to birding, which is my passion. Uh, I'll leave that to the scientists. But I, I would say I always felt that because I, my whole uh, life as an actress was about observation, and I began to observe human beings primarily, although sometimes we were asked to improvise animals in early acting classes, had to go to the zoo. Um, the, uh, I, I also believe that birding makes me acutely aware of um, observation and patterns. So I do think both things have contributed to my being certainly more attentive to what's beyond my own sphere and thoughts. Would you call yourself an intuitive actress or an intellectual one? <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an intuitive actress primarily, but I do my research, so I'm an intellectual one as well. You when, I, when you play something like, so when you play a great character like Eleanor Roosevelt, which I did in a miniseries back in the 1970s for ABC, and Ed, Edward Herman, who played FDR, and I had, um, two years to do study because ABC didn't green light the, the series for a while. Um, then I, I did an awful lot of research because it was an incumbent upon me playing such a, a great and well-known woman to, to, to do it as best as I could. You chaired the NEA at the height of the culture wars. In what ways did your stage experience prepare you for those high-level meetings? <laughs> oh, well, I guess when I, I, I always operate from nothing human is alien to me. Um, because if I'm playing a murderer or um, a, a despicable 
a deplorable character. In fact, I played a basket full of deplorables. I, <laughs> um, you know, you have to find what, it, what, is hum what is human about them and what, what you love about them. And um, so that served me pretty well when I, was, when I was up against some pretty tough cookies in Congress. What's your attitude about our future commitment to the arts under a new administration? My attitude? Oh, well, I would certainly hope that they'd subscribe to supporting the arts endowments. I think the arts endowments are extremely worthy, and we need to increase the budget to the point it was before I was in office, and that was over 20 uh, years ago. Can you describe for the audience, please, the first time you saw the Serengeti? Oh, my gosh. Well, um, I was a trustee of the Wildlife Conservation Society, which was the New York Zoological Society for 100 years before it changed its name to be consonant with the mission of conservation. And that was under a, a prescient and brilliant zoo director named William Conway, Bill Conway, uh, back in the 1980s and through the 90s. Uh, Bill, Conny, Bill Conway realized that we needed to Zoos needed to be more than just collective agencies and educational arms, but also conservation arms and spread that message with every single animal that they had in the zoo and the habitats as well. Uh, Bill Conway also recognized that with a growing human population, there was going to be no way to sustain the great mammals of the world in particular uh, through this 21st century um, unless we manage them. And this is where we're beginning to go today and why in order to save the great mammals of the world, which by the way are in absolutely critical, critical state right now. Uh, a new report came out just last week that says 67% of the great mammals we may see go by 2020, that's only four years away. Now, well, you can think about, you know the ones that are on the, the hit list right now, and that is tigers, lions, cheetahs, almost all the great cats, elephants, rhinoceros, gorillas. But imagine all the other mammals as you go down the chain, and by the way, it's not just mammals, it's also reptiles amphibians. 20% um, of mammals are bats. Bats, a number of species are bats, are, have just plummeted down to 3% uh, of what they were just 20 years ago. So we're in a very, very critical stage right now. I've forgotten the, the question, but I'm going to go on with this just a little bit because it, it, it's vital that all of us begin to jump in immediately. Uh, the only way that we are going to be able to turn this around is by each one of us giving a voice and a vote, a little bit of money to help the scientists who are on the ground trying to save these animals through the organizations or the institutions with which they're involved. So I urge everybody to pick one, two, or three organizations uh, which may have an affinity to an animal that you particularly uh, like, or a habitat, I urge you to pick a local one first of all because everything begins at home. A local one and then a larger one that may be state, regional, or the United States, and then a global one. Uh, and, and then sign the petitions online because every time you sign those petitions, it actually helps. I lobby Congress every single year. And I want you to know that if they can wave and say, I have 400,000 uh, names here signing this petition, it means a lot. So that's what I urge people to do. Uh, what, what are the main threats to these animals? Well, other than habitat loss because of growing human populations still in many parts of the world, certainly in Africa, India, China, and most of Asia and Indonesia, um, 
they are pressing more and more into lands that are being developed and taken away from the, the animals that need to thrive. The second and still major threat to animals today is exploitation. And this is for uh, commerce, but it's also illegal uh, trade in body parts or killing the animals or collecting the animals uh, or over-harvesting of fish, and so that's the second major thing. And, uh, and then it goes on from there. So we have an awful lot of work to do, but the good news is, and I do have this in my book a lot, is that people are working on it. Even local villages are working on it when their governments are not uh, involved yet, and certainly our government is lagging behind tremendously, although we have so many good local organizations and state organizations and private NGOs here in the United States that we can consider ourselves very lucky and we can keep an awful lot of uh, creatures still going. I think that's all I have to say right now. It's <laughs> a lot. The U.S. Wildlife Services uh, comes in for some criticism in your book. Yeah. Can you explain what they're doing wrong? Okay, uh, Wildlife Services began as a pest control uh, under the Agricultural Agency Department, excuse me, uh, over 100 years ago. And at that time, it was mainly rodent control for crops. But we did not have the number of pesticides and herbicides back then, certainly, that we had later. Um, now Wildlife Services has become, it's still mainly funded by taxpayers like you and me, and it has become an arm of killing of animals that are nuisance animals, and anybody can call up and say, you know, I have a beaver in my backyard, and I just can't stand it, let's get rid of it. I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to get rid of it, but we don't need to kill them. We can relocate them. And, uh, and, and so Wildlife Services, for example, last year killed something like 22,000 beavers. In the United States, they killed 8,000 ravens, not to mention legions of coyotes, uh, birds of all kinds. And this has become an egregious uh, over-exploitation of a killing machine in the, in the name of pest control. So it's really about nuisance animals to, for the most part, and I think that just go online and, and look at what Wildlife Life Services is doing and understand that you as a taxpayer are paying into this as part of the Agricultural Department. A lot of this book is based on the journals you kept on your travels. In a previous book, Command Performance, was based on your time with the NEA, also based on your journals. I'm wondering if there are any plans for a memoir that kind of goes behind <laughs> the curtain of your acting work. <laughs> oh my. Um, I never kept journals like that. <laughs> I never kept kiss and tell journals. Uh, so I don't think so. I, I kept journals when I was chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts because the White House told me to. They were concerned. I'm trying to remember uh, some cabinet minister, had, uh, cabinet uh, head had gotten involved in some court thing and he hadn't kept journals to substantiate his claims that he was innocent. So the White House then said, okay, keep a journal, t write down everything. So I did it diligently every single night when I got home. And then about two and a half years in, somebody in government got into terrible trouble and they called me up and said, get rid of your journals right away. <laughs> but I didn't, I kept them. <laughs> I kept them and I had a, a, a nice uh, 14 of them and I had conversations and everything which really served me well and I came to write my book, Command Performance, about those turbulent years in the culture wars uh, when I was chairman in 1993 to 1997. My last question, and then we'll throw this open to the audience. On stage or screen, when and where will we see you next? Uh, 
I won't be on stage for a while. I feel that in um, this critical time in wildlife conservation, if I, I can help at all and be a voice and, and try to bring awareness to people of the, of the need to, that all of us have to get involved, that's what I'm gonna be doing for the rest of my life. However, I love television, so I try to keep my hand in in television and I do have a recurring role on a series called Elementary, but just a very weird role. Um, I don't know if anybody you watch, watch it. It's uh, modern, day, modern day Sherlock Holmes with an extraordinary actor named Johnny Lee Miller and Lucy Liu. And, but Johnny Lee's just, whoa. And we have this sort of romance that are two people that can't, stand, can't look at each other, so we just communicate through letters, and we call each other C and H, I don't know. Anyway, I have that, and then I, I have probably uh, a few other of those kind of things coming up, and I have a movie that I just did with Richard Gere, who's a wonderful actor, uh, called Three Christs, and that should be coming out within the next year, and I have a lovely what they call cameo role in that. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, Thanks. Jane Alexander. Thank you. Oh, Jane, thank you for speaking to us tonight. Thank you. Years ago, I worked in a wildlife refuge in Newport, Rhode Island. I uh, learned many things, but there was one thing I could not find out, no matter who I asked. How is it that the wildlife refuge was a um, stopover for uh, migrating birds? How is it that migrating birds know that one particular area is designated for them and they stop and they nest and they feed and the Wildlife Refuge, which was um, maybe 200 acres, full of migrating birds year round. How do they know that that area is designated just for them? <laughs> I think it has to do with food. <laughs> it's, I like to say, you know, there. we have these flyways, and if you go on the Audubon web, website, which I'm very, very enthusiastic about it just, uh, this website has actually been winning awards. It's one of the best websites that I, I know of any website. If you go on that website, you'll see the whole map of the flyways in the United States. Here we live on the Atlantic Flyway, and uh, that's for migrating birds. They, they sort of move, it's like a big highway, they move back and forth. Sometimes they deviate a little more down the coast in the fall and, or up a little bit more towards Pennsylvania in the spring. I mean, we're in Pennsylvania, but you know, further west. Uh, they know because they're following food sources. So it's very important to protect these food sources. It's a little bit like being on an interstate highway and you know a whole service center is gonna be coming up soon. <laughs> no, really, you wait for lunch and you wait to get your gas there. And that's exactly what they do there. I write a chapter in, a book call, in the book called Deserts because there's one very critical uh, stop that is, is almost being eliminated by uh, global warming in the Salton Sea. The Salton Sea is the biggest inland sea for California, biggest body of water. California is undergoing an, a drought that has not been seen since the, certainly the 1500s. And will be continuing and the Salton Sea is slowly drying up more and more and this coming year things are going to be complicated because the rivers that feed it are going to be diverted to San Diego to, uh, because of a growing population there. So they're man trying to manage the Salton Sea which is a stopover on the, uh, the Western Flyway there, the Pacific Flyway for as many as 450 species of birds. And it is shrunk almost by half now and will go down to 40 to 
of what it was. And the estimate is that we'll lose an awful lot of birds because they will just not have the food that they can get in and around the Salton Sea when it shrinks to that degree. Because their next big stop and body of water is the Sea of Cortez in Mexico, and that's pretty far away. So it's, I, I suspect there are probably other circumstances as well uh, for breeding birds, but for migrating birds, for the most part, it's about food. Hello. With all your fascinating travels, I'm curious, when you're at home, what animals and pets do you have? <laughs> what animals and pets do I have? Well, in Nova Scotia, I'm very fortunate. I live with quite a lot of wildlife. And the very last picture in the book is of a porcupine. Um, porcupines are nuisances. They're really awful if, if you want to keep certain things like peach trees or plum trees or something like that. Uh, they will climb up and they'll eat the bark and they'll, then they'll eat the fruit and blah, blah, blah. But they're also fascinating, very, very clever animals. So I love, I have a resident porcupine and <laughs> The sow, she's huge. She's been with us over 13 years. She's about this, this big. And she has one, one progeny every year. And so the little one this year is now, he's about eight mo uh, six months old. And he's absolutely adorable. And he, his little porcupine's quills aren't quite strong enough to do any harm at all still. But they're getting there. You know, but when they're little, oh my gosh, you can, you can stroke them, and they're soft as can be. And I, I urge you to go online and watch this so funny one. Came out at Halloween, it's on YouTube. It's called Porcupine Eats Pumpkin. <laughs> You've gotta see this, you have got to see this. They make so many different noises, porcupines. You will not believe it. Just Porcupine eats pumpkin. Um, so that's one of my kind of pets. And as we discussed, I've gotten this incredible attitude now about wildlife, so I kind of greet them. I greet them. And the ones that live around me now know that I'm no threat at all, and they come very close. The snowshoe hare the other day was literally six feet away from me, still eating the clover. <laughs> and he has no fear of me anymore. A wild blackback gull, a, a baby only about two months old, two years ago, adopted us. His parents must have abandoned him, and he flew in and he kind of sat on the rocks. We live right on the ocean, and he just kind of sat there for a while. And I watched him for several days, and I realized he had been abandoned. So I started to, to give, leave little foods out, and oh my gosh, he came every morning at 7 a.m. and he, every evening at 5 a.m. It was like, and I could see that he was making fine uh, down on the beach eating mollusks and stuff, so he was cool. But he started a relationship with my dog. It was really weird. He, he weighed more than my dog. My, my dog uh, is a papillon, and he was like eight pounds, and this gull was like nine pounds or something big. But they, then they started to eat out of the same bowl together. It was really quite remarkable. So these are my pets. <laughs> One papillon and then all the animals that live around me. That is adorable. Uh, how do you remain optimistic and how do converse, um, conservationists still really have the strength to go on when we know we could be facing the sixth mass extinction? You know, uh, uh, extinction doesn't happen like that, unless there's a cataclysmic uh, event like a comet hitting or an asteroid hitting Mexico as happened for the dinosaurs. So um, it's, it's a slow process of blinking out. And our generation may be very aware of what we have today, but the next generation isn't, and the one after that. And you don't know, you won't miss what you don't know. 
Now, I am all for saving these creatures because we need them. We need all the natural resources that we live with. They, we depend on everything in nature to sustain us, and not just spiritually, but all the minerals that we put in all our tech equipment, all the food, you name it, everything. Interesting thing I just read the other day is the little Tasmanian devil, which uh, lives down in the Australian and Tasmania area and is a, a highly endangered species today. It's just been discovered the blood of the Tasmanian devil is, is an antidote to the superbugs that we have today. They just discovered that. So we don't even know what we need all these natural resources for. And I loved the Pope, Pope's, um, Pope Francis's encyclical last year because he said, we have to go on faith that every single thing in the world means something because we're all interconnected and we don't understand the complexity of it all. So we just have to go on faith that they're all important and keep it all alive. And that's my, my viewpoint, certainly, as well. So you have to have hope that way. Uh, are we going to lose creatures? Absolutely. But keep in mind that evolution keeps going. We lose about 23,000 species, and I'm going to include everything, and in, that includes botany, uh, the tiniest little bacterium, amoebas, and so on. 23,000 a year we're losing normally with extinction, but about 15,000 are being discovered every year. Also of the same orders that we don't usually run into but scientists understand. So there's a lot more going on than is even we can fix in one mind. So why should we despair about it? We can't despair about it. It's far bigger. And that's what I mean by spirituality. It's far bigger than we can understand. All we have to do is try to keep it whole and keep it together because it depends on our health as well. Next question. All right, there's a right in red behind you, Paula, just a couple rows oh. back. Is there anything that kids could do to help out with conservations for endangered animals? And also, what's your intake on the black rhino? What did you say about black, black rhino? What's what did you say about black rhino? What's your take on the black rhino? My take, yeah. OK. <laughs> Let me just start with the black rhino, because all rhinos are in real trouble because they have this strange horn made of keratin. It's not ivory like elephants or walruses. It's keratin. It's like your fingernails. You might as well chop up your fingernails and eat them for all the medicinal good the rhino horn would do. But they, you know, that's a very ancient belief in certain traditional Asian medicines that rhino horn will be beneficial to you, so they're being uh, killed. And it's alarming what's happening with uh, black rhinos, but particularly the northern right rhino, white rhino, which is actually extinct almost. It's just three creatures left, and they don't have a breeding population. None of none, those three can't, can't uh, manage it. So they're, they're, on, they're out, but the southern white rhino is uh, the same species, subspecies, and they're holding on in South Africa. What we need to do is uh, help get rid of the criminal elements that are taking the horns away from these rhinos. Uh, I don't think most conservationists buy some of the new techniques, which is flooding the market with fake rhino horn, because they think after a while uh, people will catch on that the, the fake ones are fake, uh, even though it may lower the price temporarily, or painting the horns pink, which a lot of uh, people are suggesting. Once we get enough resources, and that means money and political and public will to catch the criminals, we will put an end to this business of poaching rhinos. 
in Nepal. They have not had a rhino poached in over since 2008. And that was in the park Chitwan, where the Sumatran rhino, and uh, I think they may have a few others there for now. Um, and they, the reason they did that was because they brought the army in. And they have the army uh, patrolling and getting rid of the poachers. So that's the black rhino. As for what you can do, yes, you can do everything that any adult can do. There was a young man in an audience not long ago, and, I, and he got up and he said, I love the two-toed sloth. How can I protect the two-toed sloth? And there is an organization in Costa Rica which does just that. So you can go online if you're able to or, or have friends help you, and you can find an organization that might let you protect the animal you love. Do you have one particular animal that you love? The black rhino. There's absolutely organizations to protect rhinos. And if I were you, I would help get some help, or you go online and find those organizations in Africa and support them. And be sure to vote your petition every time, OK? You spoke early of the relationship between people and gorillas, and later uh, your personal relationship with a seagull and a porcupine and a, and a small porcupine. And I read a book a few months ago, maybe others here have read it, that, uh, in, that uh, have to do with the same subject. And it's a book about octopuses. Uh, the book is called The Soul. I urge that you read it. The soul of an octopus. These can be huge oceanic creatures. And they exist in, the, in aquariums around the, around the world. And uh, the people that take care of these octopuses, the plural is not octopi, it's octopuses. It's a, <laughs> the octopi would be Latin, and octopus is Greek. It points that out in the first part of the book. <laughs> the, um, where the octopus can recognize different people that come into the aquarium. And they know and can act hostile towards some and not toward others. And sometimes the octopus will come up and look at them right through the, uh, the, the glass or plexiglass, whatever it is, and they know, they, as they stare at it, they know whether it's hungry or whether it's not hungry. There's an eye contact. <laughs> uh, and this animal is huge, but it may have the brain the size of a grape. And their personal relationships have progressed to the point where they give these octopuses names. And, so, and they're very, there's an emotional relationship you develop with the, I couldn't believe it when I started to read, I wonder why am I reading this book? But after <laughs> listening to you talk, I, it's called, I think it's called The Soul of an Octopus. I just read it a few months ago. That sounds can, wonderful, I'm gonna get it. Thank you. Well, I think we're heading in that direction. I, and as I say, if Carl Safina, a major marine scientist, is heading in that direction, then I think all of us can head in that direction, and it actually is not a bad direction to, help, to head in, because um, as the Dalai Lama says, all living creatures come towards comfort and good feeling and move away from fear. So that if we, if we have our arms open to understand what these creatures are about, uh, then they will begin to come more and more to us. I, I love the story that a friend of mine told about Ten divers were helping a humpback whale on the west coast some years ago uh, uh, get untangled from a net underwater. And it took quite a few hours underwater to, to get all the net off this whale. And the whale, when it was finally free of all the netting, did not swim right away, but went to each of the divers and bumped him and made eye contact with the divers through their masks. Pretty amazing. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of amazing animal stories, and I think once we open up our arms and really just look at them, and even the lowliest creatures, I'm getting so stupid now, I pick up these little teeny, like crickets. I got into a relationship with a cricket recently. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, the cricket was in my bathroom, and I said, what are you doing here, you know? And I said, so I picked it up, and then I just kind of looked at it, and I looked at its eyes, and we had kind of a little moment there. <laughs> and, 
And then I just took it out and put it outside. But this is what's happening to me. I'm going like gaga. But it, and, I'm, I, and I'm finding, as I say, that these, these animals are feeling really comfortable around me, these wild creatures. Now, I have to be very careful because I live in an area of Nova Scotia where there's a lot of hunters. And so, um, and I, actually, I, I, I respect hunters if they are responsible and they're culling herds like there's a lot of deer, as we know, because there's no apex predators on the East Coast for, for white-tailed deer. And we do need to cull those herds because then, then you get a trophic cascade and, the, and they, they browse out everything that's below them. So I do believe in responsible culling of, of herds, but I have to be very careful that, there are, that irresponsible hunters don't come into uh, the property that I'm in or my neighbor's property and, and uh, do harm to, to the gentle nature of the, of the area. I thank you for this book and for all the wonderful stories in it. Ladies and gentlemen, Jane Alexander. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much for having me.